Okay. Thank you, uh, Ajay uh, Sharma, for coming back on. Uh, my name is Joel McLeod. I'm here with Roland Tanner. It's the 905er Roundup. Uh, we are, this is going to be a good one, folks, because we're all fired up over recent news. <laughs> uh, basically, a, a theme of this episode is just going to be, you know, the, the proof of conservative, the conservative provincial government is just throwing the most vulnerable of our, our people our society under the the wheels of privatization, uh, and tragically, uh, it is it looks like it's leading to to deaths. Um, so, starting off, let's go get into it. Basically, Ontario has announced uh, that it's cutting out the funding of the ten dollar a day daycare system that the feds signed the province up to. We had on a previous episode, I'll put the show note, put a link to it in the show notes, uh, with the architect of that program when it first came out, Karina, Mr. Uh, Karina Gould of Burlington, uh, to give us the outline then. That was a couple of years ago. Since then, I think it's been a disaster of a rollout, and it looks like it's going to continue to be a disaster of a rollout because uh, the province says they're just, all the private funded daycares, if they don't sign on to this $10 a day program, they're just cutting out the funding, which means uh, staff at those uh, daycares are losing the $2 an hour uh, wage increase. That's going to hurt them and possibly lose staff away from those that, uh, that privatized uh, model. And any new uh, little ones being signed up to those not participating are going to pay the full rate. Basically, we're going into a two-tier daycare system here in the province. Um, couple, uh, as well as that, the news that the province, for any daycare system, any daycare that was housed in a provincial building, so the province was the landlord, the province is jacking the rent, monthly rent up uh, for these uh, facilities. Again, cause bringing the cost up for uh, for for parents. Or eating into this ten dollar a day program, uh, the federal money, which is basically just like a siphon to suck up the money into the co provincial coffers. Supposedly, I guess, why not uh, to to pay off that? I am, uh, as you can tell, listeners, I'm not a fan of this. Roland, AJ, what, what, what? You know, tell me, tell me why I'm wrong. Tell me why I'm right. Tell me, just suck it up and get over it, because that's what I'm sure a lot of our uh, our more right-wing listeners are going to be saying in the comments. Well, I'm going to defer to OJ as, as uh, uh, you two have children. You you both have skin in the game, so to speak, <laughs> if that isn't a horrible kind of <laughs> image. <laughs> uh, I do not. So, uh, but you, you go in first, OJ. I, I, I also am pretty horrified, but uh, it doesn't directly, directly affect me quite in the same way. I'm happy to it. Um, there's this thing called the multiplier effect when you make these decisions and there's unintended and in, uh, intended consequences of what you do based on these choices and the transaction costs of this decision are going to be awful. You can see that a mile off. You don't have to be a policy expert. A couple of reasons why. Number one, you're taking away this subsidy, which invariably has, regardless of whether or not the program has been a success or not, you can't just kneecap a program in its infant stage, which is really what it is. It takes a while to roll out, right? So that's number one. Number two, um, you're you're burdening the you're putting the onus and the burden back onto parents by removing this, by penalizing them, by saying you're essentially double dipping. So we're going to wipe you out there. Uh, but here's the other part: Who do you think are the majority of the people that work at daycares? Many, you walk by any daycare, whether it's a Montessori or any other type of daycare in Ontario, and you will see that a lot of, the, number one, 100% of the employees are women. I defy you to show me a daycare where that's not the case, right? Mm -hmm. That's one. Mm -hmm. Number two, many of the employees are women of color, primarily immigrants, who, as we know, come to this country with exceptional academic accreditations from their host country through whatever bureaucratic nonsense in this province, in this country, they cannot get their accreditations. So they're forced to take on whatever work they can. And they're already in a negative position in terms of taking care of the income for their families. And so they're in this 
job, which they do with great pride. I know this for a fact, but they're underpaid for what their accreditations are. And so now you're telling somebody who's working this job, we're going to give you even less because we value you so little. But by the way, thank you for coming to Canada. Thank you for increasing our population you know, as we need. Um, thanks for all that, but you're worthless. So at the same time, you're telling kids you're not worth the investment. You're telling uh, parents, suck it up. You chose to have kids. We're putting more of a burden on you, which is wrong because we also have the other issue of you can't really sustainably raise a family on a one income household these days. You can't. And whether it's two incomes working at moderate income jobs or high or low, it doesn't matter. You still need those double incomes. And so now we're really, what we're doing is, you know, that expression trickle down economics where it's really a facade and it's not really true. Yep, well, yep. it's comparable to this where they're saying, as Joe was saying, you know, the private sector will figure it out. We'll, we'll figure this out, my friends. That's how he talks, our premier, right? And so it's just going to deflate the ability of people to take care of their families. And it's just going to increase the poverty level. What gets me about this whole it, it's that it's that privatization. It's it's a laziness on the part of the conservatives, and it's it's just conservative minded governments like worldwide. It's not even that they 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 sugarcoat it with this. It's our philosophy, you know. The you know private sector is more efficient. It's better, and it's right. not in this situation. It is just not because that's the, that's why we had the ten dollar a day daycare being brought in. Was that the private sector came in and they said we'll provide daycare and it's you can have you have various levels of daycare like there it's not every daycare is the same some are better than others and you pay for it but the problem is even like the bare minimum it's a mortgage you basically take out a mortgage payment an extra mortgage payment a month for your kid god forbid if you have two or three kids that require to go into daycare you know um i i there's a, i want to touch on one thing that you said aj was that the you know you had kids suck it up kind of mantra that we hear from right wing mm -hmm. supporters of, you know, this privatization, like that's just the cost of raising kids. You, you have to be responsible for that. One, um, fuck you. Uh, I second that. Cause you know, like it did the one also ones like who, who, who jump on about falling birth rates. Mm. Uh, 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 of uh, in in this province and in this country, and this is one of the factors. People say, "Well, I don't want to have kids, or I'll push off having kids until I can be financially responsible." Which, surprise, surprise, at the market rates of daycare is never. It is never responsible then to have kids. It's just not, and that's a whole other economic problem. There, that's why this ten dollar day program was good for the economy. Second, Ali, um. What happens to the family that you say, they say, even if they did plan ahead, right? They did plan ahead. I'm going to have a kid and they plan on one kid and oops, they have twins. God's gift. God, God's gift, your burden. Yeah. Right. And it's yeah. like, like, don't, don't give me this, like, oh, it's your responsibility. It's all individual. It's not. Because if you want to do this individual responsibility nonsense, eventually it comes back and it bites you in the butt. And those same people, I would love to see them suffering to pay off like a medical bill or whatever but we're not at least i thought we're not that society we're, we're supposed to be compassionate and look after each other i will say this uh and ron you can jump in with this one because i know we've talked about it uh i do think the federal government needs to hold a lot of blame on this this was their program this was their money and they've just handed it off to conservative governments that quite frankly, I think I've proven to be an untrustworthy partner on this. They say one thing to your face and then do the complete opposite behind your back. They are taking your money. They're not providing a network to grow childcare spaces for families in Ontario. It's just, we're just going to take the money and see if we can pocket it through increased rent now. We're not going to provide a public not-for-profit option for families to replace possibly a dwindling supply of private uh, daycare providers, who knows? And we've heard nothing from uh, Karina Gould, who is the minister who created this. I think there's a new minister in charge of the, that program now, but we don't hear anything from the federal government of saying, 
this is unacceptable. We're going to, we're going to start throwing down the hammer for you to guys to hold up to the spirit and the intention of this agreement. And I, I'm going to call them out on this. This is like, this was your program. Follow it through. It's, uh, yeah. And it, it, this is something that's happened multiple times now. You know, we saw during, during COVID the federal government stepped in and I thought they did exactly what needed to be done. It's like, what can the federal government do in, in a situation of a global event like that it can basically spend money to bail people out and it did but it spent money to bail out the province as well and the province said oh that's nice we'll just pay down the deficit with that thanks very much you know money earmarked for education didn't get to education uh and it's, it's i do kind of feel it's like well surely to god the federal government can do something more to make sure that the money it's providing actually goes where it's meant to go and you know this is this is the second or third or maybe even fourth instance. I'm just trying to think of the other examples where the federal government has increased spending in an area, which is immediately followed by the province cutting that spending in, on their side. So, and you know, it, it's dumb because the federal government isn't even getting the credit for what they're doing. The province is kind of pulling this bait and switch and the public is getting screwed because like we're promised these amazing things which are built on the basis of the province and the feds working together uh, to provide you know the benefits of this increased funding and you end up kind of back where we are now it's not exactly back where we started but it's still it's undermining this project uh, right from the get go um and the, you know other problems obviously are you know it's oddly enough it's actually undermining private companies here that that are trying to go their own way for whatever reason um which again you're not you're not helping business you know the things that the, the pcs always claim that they're the friend of business well this is screwing business and thirdly you know all that stuff about family politics and family this and family that and defending the family it push comes to shove when it comes to doing what it we need to get well educated uh, well cared for children at the in the earliest days of the life where you know everything is being formed uh, that is going to be the building blocks for the future of the, those children the government couldn't give a damn is going to screw them over so so much for family politics you know it's just hypocrisy when if rubber reaches the road they're screwing all the people that they say that they're the friend of business children <laughs> families <laughs> Where do you, where do you start with this stuff? You know, it's 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 just uh, unbelievable, uh, and yet they're way ahead in the polls. And you know, so what do they care? I guess they did have form for this, though, right? They they started this process early and aggressively. Uh, when you go back to when they were elected, what was years of two thousand eighteen when they first came in? Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, so. Many of your listeners, viewers may not, some may remember that when they came in, the first thing they did was kneecap um, provincial assistance programs for people with disabilities. And what did they target first? The most expensive ones. And what does that focus in on? Kids, because kids are expensive. That's going back to your whole point, right? It goes hand in glove with the daycare. When you look at austerity, they'll, they'll call it, you know, looking for efficiencies and removing duplication and all this neoliberal bullshit, um, which I'm sure your conservative listeners will get really upset about, but that's what it is, neoliberal bullshit. There's no proof that it works um, the, to the extent that it does what it said it's going to do. And so they cut the program where, you know, kid with autism or any other developmental concern um, lost funding to $20,000 a year of treatment. And so what is a supporter of the PC party going to say? That's the cost of raising kids in Ontario. Well, nobody in their rational mind thinks that they are going to be paying out of pocket 20 grand uh, a year just for their kid to reach in quotes, standard levels of operation if they have a disability or anything and the language is crass but let's just say it for what it is nor you know if you let's take it a little bit further uh, having you know skin in the game more than just a kid in school we talk about kids that need devices to function the government doesn't cover these to the extent it should you're still paying over a thousand dollars out of pocket for afos ankle foot orthotics for your kid to have aligned legs and feet so they can walk 
-hmm. Okay. So is that now something that a family must bear? Does government not have a collective responsibility to help those that are most in need? That's the whole point of setting up government if you believe it's there to provide public services. So we're not offering therapy. We're not offering daycare. We're not offering support for very expensive devices. What if you are towards the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum? To put it bluntly, what if you're poor? Well, then you're screwed. Right. You're absolutely, and I'll use it, you're absolutely fucked under this scenario. Um, well, that's that, just... And what if you're working in a daycare and you rely on all these services? There are yeah. people who work in daycares who have disabled children uh, as well and who do have another range of things. It's almost like if you're disabled and not rich, you're screwed in Ontario. But even that is... Like the, the idea of like, well, the rich can pay for it is, I think, a misnomer. I, some do, but depending on the on the level of disability with your your child, it's it's an expensive endeavor. Um, it, it's it's, but it, it's so easy to kind of just push it aside. Like, I don't know if this this matter with the the daycare funding is going to be a make or break issue because it's so easy to push aside because. I'm lucky my kids are out of the daycare years. Um, I have family that are very much involved in that level of care. So I, I, I do care about them. But, you know, the majority of the, the voting, the seniors that vote, you know, yeah, it might be grand, uh, grandmother, grandfather, mm -hmm. who have to deal with it, but there may be thinking like, well, no, now I get to have, you know, sonny or daughter, granddaughter or grandson come hang out with me for a, for a, for a day. And I get to be, mm. I don't really care. And it's, but you're right. There are so many poor families, poor mothers and poor fathers who, who rely on this to say, I, this is how I'm able to put money away to put money um, to make ends meet. And it's just kneecapping them. Uh, I, 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 I want to move on take a, this one to kind of, move on to the next kind of topic we're talking about. And this is, again, the theme of just this government does not care about kids was this morning, uh, Global News reported that basically we are, this is this is just, it should anger you no matter what you're leaning on the political spectrum is, is that our, our Care for Children Network, the Children Aid Society network that we've set up throughout this province uh, is completely failing kids. According to the Global News, they're reporting that uh, once every three days, a child care a child dies while in care of the province. I'm going to say that again. Every three days, a child in the care of this province dies. That is unacceptable, regardless of your political leanings. And if you're trying to come up with an excuse or, or a rationale for it, just stop because this is, this is, in my opinion, Walkerton level incompetence, corruption, that they, this government should be turfed out based on this news. Uh, this is, this is worse than Walkerton, in my opinion. If one, you know, we're talking of 354 children between 2020 and 2022, um, uh, that died in the care of this government in some form. We don't know why they died. And that's the other thing is there's so many deaths that happened that we don't have the budget to do a proper inquiry into learning the causes why. And the government doesn't want to put the money aside. They don't want to invest the money. They don't care to find out why did these kids die. I, I don't have the words to articulate how disgusting and uncallous this is. I really don't. You can, if you want an analogy, look how callous, let me, let me back up before I go there. One of the things I do in class is when we're lecturing on certain topics that are important in not only in this country, but to any country when it comes to um, the welfare of children, right? Um, Here's here's a stat. This is, uh, and I'll share it with both of you after. But I, it would be neat for me to put it on screen somehow. Um, and it's from the CBC, and I use this in class. Um, during the residential school era, a child was more likely to die there 
than somebody serving a Canadian serving in World War II. One in 22. Now, contrast, bring that right up today. So there we did that. And you know how many segments of society have brushed that under and don't even want to discuss it. And they say, oh, this is unimportant. Don't care. Don't want to deal with it for whatever reason. And now you're looking at something that's happening in your face today, wards of the state dying under the care of the state, which brings back, it brings a couple of things in. Number one, pardon my language, because this one upset me too. Who the fuck is running these places? Absolutely. That's num yeah. That's yeah. number one. Number one, who the fuck is running these places? Number two, how much are we not doing? Not what are we doing, but how much are we not doing in terms of, you mentioned the point, we don't even have the resources to have public inquiries into why these children are dying. So, and is this going to be another one of those things that, you know, if it comes up during election time, Doug's going to get on his podium and say, you know what, this is unacceptable. We're going to get to the bottom of this. And, you know, it's clear that government bureaucracy doesn't work and we need the private sector for innovations. Is that where it's going to go? Because that's where a lot of these things, when it comes to human welfare and health in this province, seem to have gone. And the fact that I'm only hearing about this from you today, like I knew the CAS system was not good. I know it's not. But a child every three days is not what a leading G7 economy should be leaning on and being proud of, right? I mean, there's something abhorrently wrong. But I don't think, sadly, you're going to get any answers on this because whatever answers they uncover, they're going to deflect blame. And no one's going to assume any responsibility other than trashing the public servants who I bet are underpaid and overworked. But here's the thing with this situation, it's not the public servants. Like we we don't, and that's what people are assuming, like, oh, these are taxpayer fund. They are taxpayer funded, but they're private entities. Correct. And they are, and that, that's kind of the the bullshit of it is that the in the the effort of finding efficiencies in in this care, it's well, we'll privatize it. Except the money still comes from us because yeah, as you said, Jay, like nobody can afford this stuff out of pocket. It, it is it is pricey to to provide the care that you you would instinctively think. A fellow, another human being, especially a child, would require. It's pricey. It is costly. Not let alone the labor involved, the the services that would be needed. In the case of child aid, you might be talking about some kind of mental health right. requirement involved, like therapy, whatever the case may be. It is costly. It is good. It requires deep pockets that you and I don't have. The average Ontarian just doesn't have. But we're told, oh, pay for it out of pocket. So instead, our illustrious government gives essentially pocket change to these kids. We'll, we'll attach funding to it. Again, it's public money going to a private system. Well, how do you maximize that um, that bill? Say, if you say, like, you know, actually, I'm going to put, I'm going to attach $100,000 to you. $100,000 a year is attached to you to provide room and board, staffing. Uh, and possibly any other care for one, that might for one person, right? For one child, a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars a year. That that gets eaten up pretty quickly if you think about it. Between I know how fast. I know how fast. Right. That's gone. It sounds like a lot to you and I, but for, over the course of a year, to provide staff like round the clock staffing, care, room and board, uh, food, all that, it eats up pretty quickly. Um, so how if you're a private industry, private enterprise, how do you maximize that? Well. I cut corners. Maybe I don't have an extra staff person on on working that hour, or maybe I don't I don't require check ins as frequently as I'm supposed to, and that's where this stuff happens. Like, again, we're assuming, but that's we know that this happens in the long term care world. Of right. I don't have to check in with you all the time, so why wouldn't we assume that same model wouldn't work for children? <laughs> Out of sight, it, it will work. They will do it and they will continue to do it because it's as disgusting and abhorrent as it is. And if you put this to them, they'll say, no, that's not who we are. No, but that's what you do. 
what yes. you do is who you are. You can't run away from your record. Well, the liberals, no, 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 no. Don't give me that, well, the liberal stuff either, because that comes up too. Um, because at that point, I'd say, what? So you're comparing yourself to a bag of steaming shit. Well done, right? No, seriously, you think yeah. about it, right? Um, you want to compare yourself to that? Okay, well, what does that say about you? So you basically, and it's one of, the, it's one of those things, because if you think about where their votes come from, like any government, like it's not wards of the state. It's not people in LTCs. It's not people who are working low-income jobs. It's not people fulfilling your Amazon order or delivering your Amazon order or bringing your groceries out of Walmart. They are not the people who have, and let's be blunt about it, the disposable time to go and vote because it's voting has been made to look like a luxury for people who can who have the job and the time to do it. So the people that it's going to affect the most they're going to have zero input, close to zero input. And yeah, people will raise it, but the government is in this enviable position of being able to swat away anything that it wants. And if somebody in the Ontario legislature raises it, guess what? Gov enough Ontarians voted for this government to shut any type of meaningful discussion down um, on this. And any type of reform is going to be any type of attempt to reform to the system is just going to be met with disdain from this government. It's, it's no different than what uh, some of, most of you may have not, I'm assuming not this company here, but some of you may have fond memories of Mike Harris in 1995 to 2003. Right. And a lot of you will not, uh, but there is really no difference between what they did and what is happening here. The only actually the only difference is Mike Harris was blunt about what he was going to do and did it. Consequences be damned. Doug Ford and his government is lying their way to doing it. Consequences be damned. I I, st I firmly believe that this should be a Walkerton level. Like this should end the Ford government. Uh, like just the end. This should end it. I'm amazed that. I'll be honest, I'm, I'm amazed that this isn't causing a, a stir. Like I'm looking on social media right now and there's just like the, the opposition, the lo the liberals and the Ontario NDP are silent on this. I am astounded. Former mayor of Mississauga hasn't had much to say lately. Don't worry about that. Oh no, we've, we, that was our, that was our last week's episode. Oh boy. Yeah, I mean, I just, I and mean, I'm just looking at the the graphs of this article based on, and when I read it, I was, I was slightly just, I tried to be distrustful of everything I read. It's like, okay, where's where's the catch here? Where's the thing that makes that undermines this story that means it's not as bad as they say it is? Did you find it? No, not really. And I and look, so the graph right. is actually from Child Welfare Operations Branch, whoever they are, June mm -hmm. 2023. And it's showing three years of child deaths um, of children that are in some way under the care of the government, whether that's in in care, full time care, you know, residential, or um, being you know being monitored by social workers or uh, recently released from the care of social workers. So not necessarily you know I'm not saying children are dying in residential places like they did in the past, but. Um, in some way, the government is involved in monitoring these children because they already know that there are problems, I presume. 33%, uh, sorry, no, I've got that wrong. It's more than that. Um, between 33 and 37% of children every year, death is marked as undetermined, and another 5% is marked as undetermined suspicious. They don't even know why these children died. All they know is that they did die. Uh, and it, this is like kind of, you know, it, it's not because the source of the data is dealing with privacy concerns or anything like that. It's like mm. they just don't know. Obviously, you know, not that important. I don't know. Uh, it seems like a really outrageous number of children to be dying in this way. And I know the article mentions that, that you know, quite a number die, you know, within six months of being kind of released from the care of a social worker, the child has died. Uh it's like something, you know, this at the very least, at the very least, putting in the most cautious and careful way possible to not sort of jump on it and, and try and make political hay from it. There's a hell of a lot of questions to be answered about this article. And 
well, like you say, Joel, you know, I suspect we'll search in vain for for the opposition parties asking those questions. Um, and I just really despair for like political opposition and, and you know, media opposition. I mean, fair enough. Um, the uh, who's, who's, it's Global News who have the article. I hope some other media companies take a look at this, you know, rather than you know, uh, podcasts like this who try our best, but you know, <laughs> you know the. Toronto Star or the Globe or whoever, you know, it seems like something that's well worth further investigation. You know, comparing these statistics with other provinces, comparing these statistics with uh, um, uh, other countries. You know, is is this normal that this many children die? Um, uh, that a, that a, you know one manner or another being monitored, being cared for uh, by by the state it seems very very messed up. Uh, and that's the most cautious that I uh, I can kind of put it uh, to be, you know, Maybe trying to be something worth worth uh, sending a note to a sitting MPP who also happens to be a minister of one's constituency um, and to, you know, inquire as a concerned citizen who read some appalling statistics on a national news outlet. Um, if your MPP is not going to take the time to respond to you in a considerate manner, um, then that should tell you all you really need to know with respect to how they view this situation. Well, and I, mean, I call it situation, not trying to minimize or make it lightly, but what well, hell's hellscape, right? If that's what's going on. Well, it, I mean, the, in the article that the globe, uh, sorry, Global News uh, uh, posted, they've reached out to the minister in charge, and of course, the the Ontario PC minister uh, is unavailable for for discussion. Right. Uh, what and I, that's that's typical, right? Whenever if it's not a chance for Doug Ford to stand in front of a mic and give us all folks all shucks, mm -hmm. uh, you know, turn at the camera, they all run cut and run and hide. They're cowards to it from the light. What gets me? I'm going to bring it back to the uh, opposition though. Is uh, the minister in charge of this? Uh, sorry, the shadow minister in charge of this, Monique Taylor of the Ontario NDP. Uh, just announced recently that she's planning to vacate the provincial party and she's going to seek a, a federal nomination for Hamilton Mountain. And I'm like, what? Like this, this is how you'd win the next election is by, again, this is Walkerton 4.0. It is one every three days a child dies within the care of the Doug Ford government should be the rallying cry of every NDP liberal member on the face of the planet. And I am furious that she's just going to cut and run to go to the federal NDP where they're going to end off like bumming for change um, to, to get their words. Like I, I, I am just, when we need somebody to kind of take this fight to the public, the person that should be doing it is saying, no, I'm out. I'm tapping out. Thanks. Thanks for the, thanks for the fish folks. I'm out. I'm just disgusted by our leadership at, at the, on this, this is, you know, we have kids dying in our, in our provincial care. And literally it seems like no one gives a rat's ass. Well, and and th th the thing that I thought was interesting about that as well, is that I would think right now with the, the, the environment that we're in, that you know, if you're an ambitious politician, um, you have far better chances of advancement um, as uh, within the, the official opposition in Ontario uh, in a situation where there's an existing conservative government that you know, much as they look like they're going to form another government, you know, can only go down, so to speak, um, to go into a third place party in in Ottawa, where it looks like the NDP and the Liberals might be about to get their asses absolutely handed to them, mm -hmm. uh, I don't. This is not the way you don't jump ship from 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 a winning team to a to a team that's looking pretty shaky. Uh, so it doesn't speak very well for you know. It doesn't speak well for 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 the ND for the provincial NDP that that that, that she's doing this. Um, and like you say, it's kind of like you know, 
you, you know, are you going to go sit, sit on the bank benches in Ottawa uh, or actually be like a, a government critic here in Ontario, you know, fairly high profile. Um, and May I, I suggest it it's just a so. case of self de- self interest. It's like I've done I'm what sure. I can do here. You know what? Yeah. I may, I'll have a more national platform. I just won't be stuck in some bench at the front bench in Ontario. I'll be a national MP. You know, I'll be on global national. I can make a face for myself. But you know what? In terms of impact, damp squib. I won't have any. Okay any impact whatsoever and you see that right you see you see plenty of mps bailing at the lure of being involved in federal politics because that's where in quotes all the actions at and you're right and, i mean and, uh, had the, she sorry go ahead well as i say i and I, I do know from previous conversations that um you know it's not, in a lot of ways the federal job is a lot more cushy shall we say um particularly if you live in the 905 actually this you know if you live mm-hmm. certainly it used to be burlington you know, basically, um, technically, if you live in Burlington, you can have a a paid for uh, uh, apartment in in Toronto, so you don't have to go backwards and forwards in the train. But actually, no one uses those. Certainly, no one in in the uh, Liberals or the uh, NDP uses those because it looks like crap for you to have a paid apartment in Toronto when you live in Burlington. Now, I don't know if that also applies in Hamilton, but. They actually have a pretty tough life, and but if you're going to work in Ottawa, where you're getting your plane fee, you stay up there all week, you get your accommodation. It's I've heard from MPs, you know, uh, who who were in Ottawa. You know, there's it's like no way they ever wanted to, to 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 have a provincial job because it sucks. It's really hard work, mm-hmm. uh, and, and so maybe that's what's going on here. I mean, I I just don't know, but it certainly doesn't speak to you know any level of confidence in the provincial NDP that she would do this. Well, I think that's yeah. what it comes down to is that there's, you know, it, it does strike me as you have a lack of confidence that your leader can carry you across the finish line too. I mean, yeah, you're right. Being a backbencher in Queens Park probably does suck. However, being a minister in Queens Park, in the Queens Park government is a pretty sweet deal. Uh, you know, you you get the you get the paid uh, uh, chauffeur. You get the uh, yeah, yeah. you get the the to meet with all the top brass in the province, and you get to be in the press all the time. Uh, hopefully for right stuff, but you got to want the job, and that's what I find this shocking. Of I, I think it's an enormously gross miscalculation of NDP popularity across uh, Canada on Monique Taylor's part. But regardless, I'm looking at this and saying. This we we need people to hold this government to account because Lord knows our uh you know nobody else is we're trying to as best we can but the government doesn't want to hold it to account and they're going to find some way to to shluck it off to another private fund private donor or private uh, enterprise matter and at the end of the day you know we have one uh, one kid dead every three days and again. Mike Harris and Ernie Eves got turfed out over Walkerton, and that was far fewer deaths. This should be, you know, Ontario should be banging at the doors of Queen's Park, demanding the heads of Doug Ford and his ministers for this. It's unconscionable. It's unbelievable. I, I am. I. I don't. I. I, I want to say I thought that this government can sink no sick any lower and yet here we are and i'm thinking if that's the case there's probably even lower that we can go but i guess we just start have to to start giving a crap about the the most vulnerable in our in our province you can you can make a difference look you you can make a difference and you can be heard and you can hold the government to account and you can embarrass them and you can really embarrass them just look at what mike schreiner does one guy one guy standing up, taking his time in the legislature, making points. He may agree or disagree with his points, but he stands up in a principled manner and holds the government to account. And he does tell Ontarians, look, I'm doing my job. I'm asking these questions. Mm-hmm. Where are the rest of the people? Where are the rest of the people that you elect? And, you know, for a member of the NDP who could hold a critical position, whether in opposition which she does, or whether as a potential government, which 
let's be clear, they could have formed government had they not screwed it up an election or two ago. Um, they can have a tremendous impact, but they just, it's going to sound awful. Maybe they just don't want to put the work in anymore. Maybe it's as simple as that. Maybe they've just had enough. Maybe they've been told, hey, you've served your time. Now you can go, you can be elevated upwards. Here's your reward for being a good, loyal soldier. You can look at it. Some people say, well, that's a very cynical thing to do. Prove me wrong. People mm -hmm. do it, right? It's called career advancement. It's disgusting when it comes to the welfare of children. And when you can't, that, see, that's the point, right? That's the sickening part. Right. Right. That, that, that right there is the sickening part where you've all this news come out and you're like, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm bailing folks, um, you know, thanks, but I'm not sticking around anymore. And, and, and when you're actually needed, you're, 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 you're abandoning ship. Uh, and to what? A ship that's already sinking, which is the right. federal NDP. You know what? A ship, I, a ship, a ship that's best future appears to be at a submarine. <laughs> well, I, I, I have better. I think you'd be safer on the Titanic than with yeah. the federal NDP at this point. But at that point, I think, uh, why don't we put a, a pin in this conversation? Because I think this is going to come. I'm hoping this comes back into the public's eye over the next few months. Um, and hopefully we can revisit it in something positive might come out of this who who knows uh but uh Ajay Sharma thank you once again for coming on jamming with us uh being a slice of gentlemen it's been fun it's always fun all right sad yeah. but fun at the same sad, time yeah yeah right. cheers everybody yeah thank you